really interesting that even, you know, with something so obvious as a safety belt, my mom said, we don't actually know what the developmental implications of tying your kids up like that is. And we never will. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I think everybody on the call here remembers the days of flopping around in the back seat of the car as your parents drove around or whatever. No, no restraints, no whatever. Uh, yeah. Um, so we were just talking about sort of perceptions of, of things over time. We started, uh, Hank and I were just just sort of chewing the fat a little bit before the call started about uh, political correctness and identity and things like that. And what do you do with people uh, who did bad things? And it all, it was provoked by the 1010 art that I've put on the wall to my right here. Um, because if you know anything about 1010, he was Belgian and some of his earliest cartoons are kind of racist uh, and, and you know, not great, but his line art is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And and I did a video, which I'll post in the chat. I did a video long ago called uh, Globetrotting Boy Detective, uh, in which it dawned on me as an adult not that long ago that my childhood heroes, um, actually, let me do a, let me go see if I can... Uh, here we go. Uh, it dawned on me that um, my heroes in childhood, there we go. Uh, it, it dawned on me one day that my, my childhood heroes in fiction, uh, uh, and later Calvin and Hobbes, but uh, Johnny Quest, Rick Brandt, and Tan Tan. Uh, Rick Brandt was a, a sci the Rick Brandt science adventure stories were sort of between Hardy Boys and Tom Swift. It was a, a series meant for boys back in the day, uh, but it was a, a young boy who is the son of a scientist in a scientific community that lives on Spindrift Island off the coast of New Jersey, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and so it, it dawns on me one day that my heroes, except for Calvin maybe, although arguably this could apply to Calvin, my heroes were all um, uh, boy detectives who were globetrotting, who were going everywhere. Uh, and, uh, and that was kind of enlightening because I think that's a little bit of what I became as an adult. Anyway, no Space Ghost. I didn't watch Space Ghost. Didn't have Space Ghost. So how I is everybody? Grace. I'm good. I'm happy to be here. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Nice to see you. Yeah. yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I don't even have Space Ghost in my brain, although I've I've seen him, but he's not in my brain. So I'm going to add him now. And I, have Mouse. No idea, I have no idea who Space Ghost is or was. <laughs> it was a I cartoon in the 60s. Oh, I sure remember the Hardy Boys. Uh, speaking of uh, childhood uh, heroes and role models, but Space Ghost doesn't ring a bell. Space Ghost, Beanie and Cecil, um, Underdog, uh, Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse, yeah. I loved Mighty Mouse. Here I come Mighty to save Mouse. the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Um, Space Ghost, adding Space Ghost. Um, and I'm thinking maybe we start a little bit with some gratitude since it's uh, in the US at least, a, at least allegedly gratitude day. It's also the, the day of the great turkey slaughter. Um, but, uh, but maybe if we just want to just Either what what do you prefer? Go around the room or type into the chat things that we're grateful for. I'd rather hear it from people than read it. Sounds great. Would you like to lead off? Sure. Uh, I'm grateful to be alive. You know, the older I get, the more I appreciate waking up and getting vertical. Like that's an accomplishment. <laughs> Some days more than others. Um, I'm grateful for flavors, for food. You know, I, I love to cook and I love to eat. And sometimes I just sit there and close my eyes and chew and just feel things, you know, bursting in my mouth. I remember when I was a kid, I think it's about five and my uncle had a tomato garden. And one day in the afternoon in August, he said, come with me. And he grabbed a salt shaker and a knife. And we went outside on a hot August day and he sliced a tomato in half and put a little salt on it and handed to me and said, eat this. And I remember the tomato dripping down my chin and this flavor just flooding my mouth. And I was like, wow, the world tastes good. This is amazing because it was really hot and juicy. And ever since then, I love tomatoes. Um, How old do you think you were? About five, four five. or five. Awesome. Love yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I'm grateful for having a roof over my head and uh, a marriage of 30, well, I've been with my, my, my wife now for 33 years. Um, and uh, for lots of friends, for people on this call, uh, Judy, it's nice to see you. It's been a while. Hey, Judy. Uh, wow, good to see you all. Um, although it's a crazy hard time to be alive with so much disappearing, I'm grateful to be alive in this time. I think it's an amazing, um, amazing era in which to try and make a contribution. Doesn't mean it's easy to make a contribution, but I, I do try. Um, Seems like that I live where I live. Are... Sorry, you know that I live in this amazingly beautiful place, and um, uh, everywhere I look, there's something of beauty around me, which is kind of incredible that I get to live here. Um, I don't have to shovel snow. Having grown up in Maine, that's a, a big deal for me. Um, uh, let's see. I'm grateful for all the teachers I've had, for the people who've uh, who've taught me things, who've mentored me. Um, I'm even grateful for the tormentors. You know, I, I, I wanted mentors. I got more tormentors than mentors, but um, <laughs> they taught me things too. And I'm grateful that I managed to get to the point in my life where I can be grateful for people who tormented me and, and recognize that they were doing the best they could, which wasn't very good for me, but you know, uh, it doesn't do me any good to hold grudges. So I'm grateful for being able to let go of that. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I taught positive psychology. I taught people that how important it is to keep a gratitude journal, but I didn't realize it myself until the pandemic hit. And after about two months of going, oh, I can't do this and I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't do that. So I have to switch to focusing on gratitude. And so for the last two years, I have had uh, a lot of opportunity and a lot of practice in saying, this is what I'm grateful for, which has really helped to shift my focus from what I'm disappointed with in life and what I feel constrained by to what I'm grateful for. And I'm grateful that I actually discovered that and, and started doing it instead of just talking about it. So I'll stop there. Mm, thank you. And our, our brains head toward what we think a lot about and they rewire pretty happily into those kinds of things. Kalia, or at least Kalia's avatar. <laughs> Yay. Um, thanks for joining. Uh, Stacy, why do you, uh, let's go um, Stacy Klaus Hank. Well, I actually thought a lot about this and, you know, I started off with my house and the fact that my dogs, my, my almost 15 year old dog isn't in pain, but I came around to an answer that I normally wouldn't say out loud, but I will share it. And I'm grateful that I really like myself and that I can accept the blame and the credit and that I don't have to turn away from the parts of me that maybe in the past I would have tried to hide. And I write, you know, um, I just recently met somebody, I haven't met them physically because I've been sick with COVID. So I've been like isolated for like three weeks, but you know, we get along uh, a man and we get along really well. And when I'm talking to my friends, I'm explaining how much I think he thinks like me. And I'm saying it like it's a good thing. And I remember, you know, people would always say, oh, well, if you've met somebody just like you, you wouldn't like that. I was like, no, I think I would. <laughs> I think I would. So I'm just, I'm just grateful that, that I like myself because I can't imagine what it would be like. And I think there are a lot of people that really don't. And I'm grateful for, and that, that's not to take away that I'm not grateful for everything around me because I feel that I'm attracting all these positive things to me. So it's, um, yeah, so I'm grateful for all, all of you and just life. Thank you, Stacey. It also feels like in many societies, in many cultures, many kinds of social requirements or institutions make us feel bad about ourselves in different ways and, and take us away from the thing you just said, of uh, feeling like we're whole and fine and liking ourselves and, and all of that. Um, we're often driven away from that by culture. So thank you. Um, let's go Klaus, Hank, Judy. Yeah, I think 
the, the highlight uh, for, for me this year was that uh, our son moved to Bend and bought a house and, uh, and is doing really well uh, at work. Uh, he, he is the uh, head of culture and, and uh, employer, employer, employer branding. So something that didn't exist when I was working. But uh, um, for Samsara, you know, which is a logistics company that works with artificial intelligence to guide you know, logistics uh, uh, operations and in, in international company. So <clears throat> in the process, um, we grew really close you know, and uh, closer than we had ever been. And he wants to teach me meditation. <laughs> he comes you know, over and... Uh, uh, so we, we have you know, really you know, great conversations, and that's so important to me because I did not have uh, a dad relationship that uh, was you know, uh, was any good, and it messed me up quite a bit. And so, um, to be able to to have to have that and give that to him, you know, as a as a dad, that was that's really special. Yeah, and then we, we were able to retire to Bend uh, some years back, and it's a beautiful little town, and we have you know, uh, a very comfortable place to live. So I do love the shop, you know, so that's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a ski resort, and it's pretty high up in the mountains. But so, yeah, so this has been, I mean, as crazy uh, as everything around us is, it has still been a good year. Um, <clears throat> I found a partner, or maybe he found me, who is a retired uh, executive from a biofuel company. He was a CEO of a billion-dollar biofuel company, and he uh, decided to set up a 501c3, and he actually did this in like three weeks. It was crazy you know, to, to uh, um, how, how well connected he is. So we just, uh, we just uh, finished our website, and we'll will uh, go public on December 1. So that's that's uh, that's really uh, um, something special also you know to to uh, have uh, to have that recognition and now you know, a professional connection so we we can move into into a more into a market niche you know, that uh, is is quite apparent in the operationalization of uh, of uh, regenerative agriculture from farm to table and and all the way along the supply chain so yeah so that it has been it has been in that sense uh, from a personal perspective it has been a really good year and i'm really thankful for it um thanks Hans. You, you got me thinking a little bit um are, in your wanderings and conversations are you running into a bunch of recovering food and fuel retirees or maybe just food retirees, uh, people who were in the system, deep in the system, in production, in industrial farming, in the food logistics, in the system, uh, food services, whatever else it might be, and who ha had a, a an enlightenment of some sort about what was going on. Are you bumping into a lot of people? And and I'm, I'm I think I'm describing a bit of your personal history, in, in some sense. You you did food for your whole career, and then and then the light bulb went off that like, oh my God, we're doing this backwards, or wrong. It didn't happen until I retired you know, and started to take courses. Uh, and, and Coursera just about came up. I retired in 2012. Um, and I took courses at UC Illinois, Introduction to Sustainability, Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia, you know, MIT. So I've taken about a couple of dozen uh, uh, really amazing courses, even though they were online. I mean, they were just giving me all the information. But no. Um, my former colleagues who are still working, you know, younger uh, uh, folks, um, they are so stuck in, in this system, just like I was, you just can't move. You, know, you don't have the uh, flexibility. So Joel also, coming from the biofuel sector, you know, he couldn't really, he didn't really get into this after, until after he retired. So because when you are in this co in this corporate world, you just cannot move, right? I mean, you get, uh, this is where we're going. And when, when I, when I met, used to make, you no, know, can be, should be focused on nutrition. They put me in charge, Disney put me in charge of uh, 
socially responsible merchandising to children globally, right? I mean, for, for all the theme parks and all our operations. And they partnered me with Coca-Cola and Nestle to do so. I mean, that meant, I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. No? And, and so that's really what, what you're, what you're dealing with. It's, uh, um, to, to set, to set these, these many professional people who are working in the corporate frame free, you know, set them free to act. Um, it would, it would create a revolution because that's where all the resources are. That's where the skills are. You know, that's where you can really make a difference where the money is, you know? but it's not there yet. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. And, and I was wondering also if there was any kind of a community or a meeting place virtually for people like have gone through your experience, but you're not, you're not saying that you're meeting a, a lot of people who've had that light bulb turn on. So, so maybe I have over 5,000 people following me on LinkedIn. Um, and a lot of them are my former colleagues. So, so every, every time I talk with someone, they know exactly what I'm up to and what I'm doing. They're following me and they're reading what I'm writing. Mm -hmm. They can't comment, you know, they, they can't uh, get into it, but they're really, I mean, they're, they're, they're on the, the, the topic, at least I can get the topic out and in talk. front of them. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, we're, uh, for those of you just hitting the call, we're just doing a round starting with gratitudes and, uh, and see where that goes. Uh, so we've got Hank, Judy, Rick. Yeah. Uh, great, uh, great topic. Uh, well, I guess I have to say I'm grateful for having been able to live a good life amidst many good people around me. I'm grateful for some wonderful conversations with remarkable people leading to exciting ideas. Uh, I'm grateful to have lived at a time of relative peace the last 75 years in places that are comforting and challenging and inspiring and also relatively at peace drive along that last grateful to have come now to a personal transitional moment a moment of legacy uh, the legacy we leave behind and the legacy we leave ahead uh, from being interested in everything uh, to focus on where I may be able to make some kind of difference and grateful for moving from thinking about how to make a contribution to choosing to go for it. Uh, grateful to be still open to learning new things. Grateful for this theme in this conversation now and the opportunity to think about what gratitude is and to listen to all of you. And I, I'll leave it at that. Mm. Thanks, Klaus. I mean, thanks, Hank. <laughs> I was like looking at, <laughs> looking, at Klaus, looking at Klaus in the middle of my screen. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> thanks, Hank. Um, appreciate it. Uh, let's go, Judy, Rick, Grace. Well, I'm grateful for so many things. I've been gifted with a wonderful family that encouraged curiosity and education um, and continually learning new things to it was always the answer to my question of why is something was always well what do you think where might you look that up <laughs> and that inquisitive character has been a key part of my life throughout the passage of time I'm grateful for the opportunities I had for education many wonderful mentors and teachers, both in and out of school, um, for a collection of close friends with whom I can share things, some dating back to college days, um, which seems a very long time ago at this point, and it was. <laughs> um, grateful for the family that I now have with a daughter who's in her mid thirties and teaching at a university and engaged to be married in May Yay. and found her life partner and they seem so well suited to one another. Just, it's hard to express. It's just, I'm feeling very full of gratitude. I feel most fortunate um, to have encountered so many wonderful people along my journey 
things that helped me become a better person, a more balanced person, um, learning to meditate a number of years ago and discovering that it had its roots in my eighth grade Viet teacher who had us doing some stuff, but it came easier than for folks who'd never done anything. It was just, the list of people is almost endless because each person brings such a unique gift. And the longer they're in my life, the bigger the impact that they have. So, and I'm grateful for this group of people because it's not easy to find a group of like-minded folks who share openly, criticize responsibly, uh, question all the time. And it's been a mainstay for me during COVID actually, when I was very isolated during the height of COVID. I'm still staying relatively isolated given the persistence of the disease, but uh, it's just, Thank you to all of you. Thanks, Judy. And I'm, I'm grateful for your courage and fortitude early in your career because you've told some stories of, of being the only or one of a very few women in a man's world and engineering and other sorts of, sorts of things and chemistry. And, and it's like, you just went right straight through it and here you are. And, and, and it seems, it seems normalisher now than it did when you were busy doing it, when it was, you were a standout. That just reminds me that I meant when I was thinking about this to say I was grateful for my 30 plus year career at 3M, which is a company that actually values innovation and attempts to inspire individuality and creativity. And I couldn't have found a better place to be. So I was very fortunate and I have many friends from that that have extended well beyond retirement. And I'm grateful to be 77, 75, which I just turned this year, um, which means I've outlived all of my parents and siblings, but I have not yet outlived my grandmother. So I'm shooting for 90. <laughs> That's great. I know. Um, thank you very much. Uh, how about Rick Grace John? Well, thank you. Uh, I'm an infrequent flyer to the group, so I appreciate um the openness to the group for me to pop in uh, episodically. Um, and actually, Ken, um, I, I, I felt a great, great gratitude when you were expressing your gratitude and the cascade of gratitudes. And interesting enough, I was on a blog post this morning from a, an old friend who used to be the executive director of the Wellbeing Trust. And he was talking about gratitude on Thanksgiving, but he, he was saying the same thing. He was saying, you know, we need to practice on a regular basis. And, um, you know, it might be worthwhile considering, you know, expressing one gratitude in 30 seconds or a minute on a regular basis, just to, because I, I can feel the difference in my mindset by hearing all the gratitude that's been expressed so far. It's, it's infectious. And we don't do a very good do job of doing that. Um, so I, I just want to, uh, can encourage the option of maybe doing that on a regular basis at the beginning of all meetings. What are you grateful in 30 seconds? Because it's it's just so reinforced. Anyway, so what I'm grateful for, uh, I'll go back to my mother, who I felt that I never really expressed enough gratitude to while she was alive. And sometimes you don't realize it until somebody's gone. Um, but my mother was um, taught me everything I needed to know about equity and equality without ever mentioning those words. Um, because she, from my sibling perspective, I mean, my sibling's perspective, but from my perspective, um, she, she treated us equally and each according to their needs. And um, I, I had severe dyslexia as a kid. I won't go into the details, but um, she was an advocate for me. And if it wasn't for that, I would have never never have gotten to medical school. And uh, that set my life on a trajectory of, of security, meaning, and whatever. And I've always, I said to my mother when I was age of 16, she asked me, what do I want to be when I grow up? And I said, a doctor, an airline pilot, and a hippie in that order. So <laughs> so I have that, that, that sort of uh, old style hippie still inside of me, where I'm driven by meaning and not by money. Um, and purpose. Um, so it's something that's, uh, you know, I'm just not driven by money. Um, 
and so I, I anyway so um I'm also grateful for my wife in the background who's making lasagna I, I was going to get a recipe last night to make lasagna because we're going to some friend's house uh, but she already started preparing for it I wanted to surprise her last night and she'd already started doing the preparation so you know I'm grateful for my wife and family and uh, I need to do a better job of being grateful for people while they're still alive Yeah, um, one of my regrets is not having asked for more family history from my grandparents while they were still alive, uh, and not having had a chance to apologize for things I realized late in life that I wish you know wish I had done a little differently. Um, a, a brief side story, and it's a reverse kind of gratitude, maybe. But um, my my maternal family escaped Germany in thirty nine. And they never told me the story of how they escaped, what happened. I never got it, partly because they wanted me to have a nice childhood. Um, and then my thing when I was a kid, I don't know, uh, 11 years to 14 years, something like that, was building little model airplanes, uh, mostly World War II airplanes. So I would be sitting in the kitchen next to my grandmother, who'd be making me breakfast and lunch to go off to school with, putting little swastika decals on a Messerschmitt airplane blithely unaware that this might actually be traumatic to my grandmother and <laughs> they never said anything they never said hey jerry this hobby of yours is a little a little uh, perverse and and weirdly weirdly my hobby seemed to track into trying to figure out family history because there, there was a lot of stuff buried in that era and i don't know somehow i think that this is like a tarot card reading but but um, I was busy sort of squirreling away at this and never got the stories. Anyway, that's a regret, not a gratitude. Uh, so for some more gratitude, let's go to Grace John Kalia. It's so interesting talking about people when they're alive. I was supposed to be in the U.S. right now visiting my dad. And because um, he's not well. And he decided that because he's not well, he won't take any visitors. So Ooh. I had tickets and everything. And he and his wife were just like downright nasty um, about my visit. So that was kind of disappointing, but um, <clears throat> I'm grateful that I, I, I mean, the thing that I'm most grateful for is that I, I just have so many tools at my disposal. I've really spent a lot of my life studying how my mind works. And that includes meditation, that includes, everything from you know tony robbins to landmark to you know like all this stuff i've just done a ton and ton of work and i did that before three years ago when i needed all of this stuff <laughs> and that's, the, that's a good sequence though it's the right sequence i did yeah. it when it was time you know when there were good times and when you know like i don't know who foresaw that i mean it's not that i didn't foresee something was going to go wrong but um, and I did those things because um, I, I wasn't accomplishing what I wanted in life. And I did those things because I really had a lot of negative thinking and depression and things like that that I didn't tell people about. And um, it's interesting because it's, it's, it's not easy times for me in some ways because I live alone and, and but everything out of, uh, about my life is so great. And I notice that I wake up every morning thinking, I have a great life. I have a great life. Like I wake up and I'm like, here I am in my cute little bed that I love and my cute little room that I love. And my, or in the last few weeks I was traveling around. I was like, oh, here I am in the Giveth house in Barcelona. Here I am in, in this really cute little Airbnb. And I just wake up every morning with that thought. And I know that I put it there. Because most of my life, I woke up with the thought that life isn't worth living and that everything sucks and that I'm alone and the world is evil. And I know that I put the thoughts there in the morning that I want to have. And it took a long time to change those habits. And, and I'm really grateful that my lowest lows now are like better than my average day used to be. <laughs> um, and some of that comes with age and hormonal changes and whatever else, but I know I did the work. 
And so I'm really grateful for having been given the opportunities to do that work and the finances to do that work and the, you know, just this, these resources. And, and we do live at a really crazy time in history, but knowing that I have the resources to do something about it, right? I'm not, and like, I'm not a billionaire. I can't go save the entire world, but I at least have the emotional resources and the right groups of people who I know and, and a direction in my life. And I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful for that. All of the things that um, I was taught about education were very academic. And my mom still doesn't approve of my going to all those self-help things. She thinks it's a horrible waste of money. Even though, you know, we're Jews, it's like, you get an education, you get, you know, education is good, but that's not education. That's woo woo, blah, blah. And I didn't listen. <laughs> And it's the best education you can have. It's the best education you can have. Knowing how to manage yourself and to manage your psychology and manage your communication with others and managing it, of all the things I have, it's something people can't take away from me. It's, it's, it's not money in the bank. It's like something, and, and I see it every day. I've been quite irritable and grouchy lately and just kind of feeling grumpy and I see how I respond to people and it's like this automatic response of oh that seems like a good idea and you know here's maybe an idea for improvement or oh I can see how we have different points of view and and your point of view is very different than my perspective instead of you idiot like which is what my brain is saying my brain is saying you idiot but my mouth doesn't say that anymore it used to <laughs> you know and my eyeballs don't roll I get I spent a whole year learning how not to roll my eyes at everything people just say to, just to like change your affect. <laughs> yeah just to like yeah and, and I was in a program my coach said oh, you got to work on that I'm gonna put every time you do it it was like a whole you know it was at least three I, to six I months roll shock therapy it was just like you roll your eyes I'm like I do not and then you roll your eyes <laughs> I rolled my eyes nice. yeah I do not anyway it, it, it just but just that it, it's like you know, my dad is really afraid of death and that's why he doesn't want to see me because I haven't had my flu shots because in Europe, if you're under 65, you don't get, it's just like automatic. And, and, and I told him I would get them if he wanted, but he's just so petrified of death. And I, and I remember some of the teachings that I have around that and like around meditation and around how my ability to see the thoughts in my mind and the fears in my mind as what they are, which is thoughts in my mind. Like that person isn't actually an idiot. You think that about everybody, Grace. I'm like, yeah, I do think that about everybody. And you know, like, it's just the thoughts in your mind or when I'm, you know, like feeling like things are hopeless. I'm like, oh, well, that's just a thought in your mind. It's so, it, it just so profound and it really, I really see the contrast between myself and my family who doesn't have that kind of training and the people around me and just my ability to be with things that are the world that's scary and overwhelming and be like, oh, that's scary and overwhelming. Those are thoughts in my mind. Um, yeah, that's what I'm most grateful for. Thank you. Um, I'm grateful for your journey, Grace. Thank you and your presence. Um, and I'll, I'll just ask us to go into silence for a little bit so we can ponder what you just offered us. I don't know if you can all hear it, but there's a train in my background that is serenading the neighborhood with a with a train horn, which is unusual. That's not usually happening here, but there's some freight train that's making its way through, and I'm and it it started just as I went into silence with us, <clears throat> and I'm like it's like a little serenade. <clears throat> um, Grace, and particularly that that moment when you described you how you wake up now and how you used to wake up and all that that really struck me. 
congratulations on doing the work it's so hard and and my, yeah, my mom was I think like your your parents uh who, who stigmatized counseling therapy self-help any and any and all of those things and then suffered the consequences at the end of her life where <clears throat> the demons she hadn't dealt with basically showed up uh as as her ability to fend them off mentally dissolved yeah I mean I you know there's things I think the the big challenge you know I grew up uh, like having suicidal thoughts most of your life, you don't tell other people because you know what they're going to do with you if you tell them. And uh, and being able to just be like, oh, those are thoughts in my head. I could switch them out and I just don't have them anymore. But, but that's new. That's new. That's 10 years. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, John Kalia Stewart. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> you know, I, I could say I'm, I'm very grateful for many of the things that have been mentioned, especially Grace's. The only thing about Grace is that I'm not grateful for is that I have to come after her. Uh, but but um, thinking about that and say, oh, oh yeah, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for those things that you mentioned. Wow, that's really the heavy stuff. I said, so, okay, John, what else? What else are you grateful for? And a, an interesting one came up, and this came up before you mentioned your dad or your mom. The thing that I thought I was grateful for for this last year, well, the word that came to me first was death. But I'm not talking about in that philosophical way of, you know, if we didn't have death, we wouldn't have life. You know, I mean, yeah, that that's there. That's there. That's interesting, but it's not it's not emotionally resonant. You can't get there on a, on a bad day. What I appreciated about death this year was I lost my sister. And previously, I'd lost my nephew, who my sister's son, who was an amazing character. Um, and what both of those deaths did, especially my sister's, was it took the wounds of a distributed family that sharply, you know, just went different ways culturally and is dealing with a lot of all the classic stuff you know on some on one part of the family you know all the substance abuse and all that kind of stuff but it isn't that it's not that it's not that it's more like the we're over here you're over there so therefore we can't be together you know you you guys you you guys back east or you guys living in that other world that does zoom calls you're so different from us that we can't we can't be together and then you just kind of raise the bar you just say okay someone who we're all connected to is now dying and is now dead. Wow. Okay. What do we do about that? And fortunately, people came together. People didn't just show up at a funeral. They, they actually wrote original stuff, original poems, original stories, songs. They did multiple ceremonies. I mean, it was like people came out of the woodwork, people we hadn't heard from in years came out of the woodwork. And we said, wow, I wonder, I mean, Mary Jo, thank you. I, I, I hope you're, you're seeing this. Uh, we're sorry you had to die for it to manifest, but wow, it really is, it really is something. You really have given us a gift of appreciating indirectly you, but then appreciating what we have in our connection to each other, which we were not honoring and we were not, we were not behaving appropriately about. So that's a big one to be thankful for. And uh, I think that's enough. I think I'll just stop there. Although I really, really appreciate this group and a number of other things that have already been mentioned. Thank you, John. I, you're making me think we should have pre-death appreciation ceremonies. <laughs> And it, it reminds me of what Lauren was doing with the gratitude circles and the videos that she was creating by asking people who knew us to sort of say, what do you think of so-and-so? And it was lovely. And, and these, these moments of tribute and peace are, are important for humans. And we, we run, we sort of trample over them at risk of our sense of connectedness and equanimity and appreciation of our connections and love. Um, Kalia, I muted you earlier because you were getting a little bit of uh, ambient noise, but would you like to jump in? Kalia Stewart, then Doug. Hi. Hey. 
Oh, thanks for muting me. I was fuddling around my house. Um, <laughs> um, um, well, I'm, it's interesting to think about what we're grateful for. Um, I think for me, the fact that for a year now, I've been working with Lucy, um, um, because she's the complement that I needed to kind of take the skills and knowledge that I have out into the world and earn some money from them because we spent a long time on the edge of the frontier of the internet and nobody friggin' cared. <laughs> like, and it was really, but now it seems like we've got enough momentum behind our, the emerging technology that we're gonna make a big difference. Um, and I don't know that I could figure out how to take my skills into the market without someone who has business knowledge and speaks business, but she also cares about the planet. Like it's a very good match. So that's, um, that's Lucy, um, it says, my battery's going down. Um, no. Be fine. It's a twenty percent. Um, it's nice to see Grace and John here. Hi. Sorry, I couldn't let you into IW. We sold out. It was crazy. We had three hundred and fifty people. And it's the thirty-fifth IW workshop. Yeah. Um, one day you'll come, Jerry. I know. I know. One day I'll come. It's true. Um. Yeah, so I'm grateful for Lucy and um, my friend Laura let me sublet her place five years ago. I'm still in it. Um, Where are you geographically? What what town are you in right now? I live in Glenview in one part of a fourplex that I still sublet from your Laura because <laughs> rental markets are crazy, right? Um. And I'm finally pulling all my stuff from storage from San Leandro to this little garage here that Laura is moving out of. So I have all my stuff in one place for the first time since I left home when I was 18. Well, not quite yet, but we're getting there. Like a month from now, it'll all be on this property, which is sort of weird and great. Um, but it's kind of making me take stock of like, okay, where am I? What do I really want? What am I really, you know, what of these objects that I own am I, do I really need to keep pulling with me into the future or not? I don't know. That feels like enough. I have a business, I have a phone call with Europe at the top of the hour, so I'm going to leave because they don't have Thanksgiving. Just I know. Do, but... What's up with that? Are they just not grateful? What about their pilgrims? No, they just don't have. They have other holidays. You know, oh, right, this right. holiday is really weird. I'm Canadian. I still don't really dig this holiday. I'm like, well, you have Canadian Thanksgiving, which was passed already, right? Do you, do you celebrate that? It's not that? the same holiday. Yeah, yeah. It has the same word. It does not have the same meaning. Yeah. Like in that kind of... The, this is America's secular religious holiday. Well, as they all are, right? Yeah, but it, this is... Valentine's Day is the Hallmark holiday. Uh... No, 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 <laughs> but you don't... It, this, it's deep, man. It's like... Like America made this holiday that everybody of all religions can celebrate because it's not a religious holiday. It's just America. Now, there's a whole problem about the origins and how we reconcile that. Like, we're, I think we're going to work on it. But, you know, anyways, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, thank you for all you do to bring us together, Jerry. Oh, thanks, Kalia. You too. Um, oh, if I do want to respond to that, actually. Ahead gratitude you know when you're as far ahead of the technology as you've been Kalia getting paid for it or appreciating it is like impossible and you know I experienced that but not to the degree you do I might be two years ahead or three years you're like 20 years ahead 
20 years, 20 years of having people not understand what the heck you're talking about. Um, you know, congratulations. You know, I hear more and more talk about SSI now everywhere and your work has paid off and yeah, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I was just gonna say, if any of you subscribe to Heather Cox Richardson, who is a really good historian, every Thanksgiving Eve, she writes the story of Thanksgiving and I just posted the link to her, the one she sent yesterday. And Thanksgiving sort of was a tiny thing, almost an insignificant thing that had been forgotten until the Civil War. And uh, the Civil War was tearing the country apart and Lincoln was like, we need something to weave us together. Uh, several governors then declared a day of Thanksgiving, and then he said it's a national holiday and uh, sort of created the modern version of what we think of as Thanksgiving. So so you can sort of separate the Puritans and, and that uh, from the story a little bit, um, although that's the narratives we tell. And then just substitute that for trying to overcome racism in this country, which is a battle we're still fighting. Hey, so you swap in a different story. Um, and maybe interesting how the two crimes the nation was founded um, are both related to Thanksgiving in an odd way. Um, hmm, never thought about that before saying these sentences right now. Um, with that, let's go Stuart, Doug, then me. That's the amazing value of hearing yourself speak things for the first time when you have the courage, just let the words kind of fly out of your mouth and go, Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know I was going to say that. Um, so I'm grateful for this uh, little respite from um, hankering uh, in the world to try to make it a better place, which all of us do in our own 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 ways. So it's wonderful to just step off that rat wheel um, for this short moment in time and this short day. Um, some things evoked by this this you know this call and 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 listening um a number of people have reflected um their own personal journey and i was on the phone with my sister this morning and she was starting to talk about how um one of her friends 14 year old daughter had been um hospitalized as suicidal uh and I said, you know, it's understandable in 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 today's in today's world. And then my sister reminded me of my own bouts with suicide at a certain point in time, having, you know, <laughs> what for her were, you know, slightly frightening and difficult conversations. And it made me think about, you know, my own journey and how how fortunate um uh to have um kind of stepped onto that uh, uh, learning journey. Um, the, the um, God, I'm trying to think of that. Uh, um, the Road Less Travel, okay? Scott Peck's um, <clears throat> masterpiece, an epic book. Um, a lot of people misquote him. A lot of people say, um, and now I'm losing the quote. Um, ah, <clears throat> Many are called few. I, I, I can't remember what the misquote is, but the real quote is many are called. Ah, many, the misquote is many are called, few are chosen. But the real quote is many are called, few choose. Few choose to step onto the path of learning and growth so that you can learn how to operate your own um, machine. This extraordinary beautiful biological uh, machine that we've all been gifted as a result of human birth. Um, and, and one of the things I have I've been having gratitude for every morning is the first thing I do is, you know, and it comes from meditation practice, it, it, is celebrate the miracle of breath. It's like, holy fuck. <laughs> it still works. I'm <laughs> breathing and it's working and I can move my hands in these digits and I can ambulate and I can think and I can have this beautiful machine that I operate. You know, you look at these guys operating machinery and equipment 
um, out out building roads and stuff. And it's like we've got these extraordinary machines. And of course, you know, they degenerate a little bit, and you got to do what you have to to keep them in repair at this point in time. So I'm 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 grateful for this whole um, human um, experience. And so um, I just want to. Um, I, I posted a Thanksgiving poem, but I want to share this poem as the as a last piece of of, of check in, and I think it, <clears throat> it 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 um it relates in some way to what all of us are saying about the camaraderie and fellowship of 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 being alive, and, and it's called belonging. Comfort in body, stillness of soul, safety close to home, respite from buzzing around. Manic in search of quiet ground. Aside from what you came to do, you long for a quiet, true. Your accepted can really be <laughs> not what you do to find a real me. Deliverance sets you free, grounded, focused, how you be. For the lucky, good fortune shines, comfort of quiet minds. Your own acceptance, a powerful gift, Quiet inside without any rift. <clears throat> In this solid place, sing your song, your heart revealed where you belong. Fully seen, feeling so clean, discovering your unique human being. Fortunate, you can taste the honey, the sacred worth more than money. So um, one more thing. That I, that I wanted to say, and, and Jerry, you, um, you, you evoked it talking about making model planes. Um, part of where I've been for the last months is, you know, <clears throat> kind of running around the world, but piece of it, a chunk of it was, was uh, what I call a European Jewish history tour, um, including um, uh, many Jewish museums in Krakow, uh, a visit to Auschwitz, the Berlin Museum, um, and it was an extraordinary reminder of the pravity that human souls can, um, can step into. So, um, it's time to, you know, live mindful lives and make contributions as we can and take care of those around us. Thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm. Stuart, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, Mr. Carmichael, you are... Hi, good morning. Um, good morning. Mm -hmm. I find the, the, the grateful question uh, actually so messy because there's so many contradictory things to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, I come to the idea that at every crucial point in my life, the world offered me more than I ever expected. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, a few examples. At 15, I decided I wanted to understand the world, and people told me that the way to do that was science. So I ran away from home and ended up at Caltech. At 15? At 15. Good Lord. Okay. And um, that was interesting in itself. I mean, so I came to California because I knew it was also going to be warm, and I had no plan as to what to do. I went to the YMCA because I know you could rent a room for cheap. And uh, the person in the Y, local Y in Glendale, California, had just quit a swimming instructor. And I happened to have a uh, uh, Red Cross uh, life-saving cer training certificate, huh? uh, which I used. Uh, so then, so I got to Caltech. And by my junior year, I realized that what they meant by understanding the world was not what I meant by understanding the world. And Caltech had a program of bringing famous people to the campus to spend time with the students. And that year it was Robert Oppenheimer and I was on the committee to show him around. And he being a smart guy, he figured out that I seemed confused about what to do. And he said, what are you gonna do when you finish? I said, I have no idea. He said, well, I have a friend who's chairman of the psych department at Berkeley. Why don't you go up and talk to him? So I did that. So I ended up at Berkeley for a while and got a PhD in developmental psych and um, realized that psychology had gotten quite mechanical and had lost the human touch. 
So one thing led to another. I ended up going to Mexico and studying with Eric Fromm and becoming a psychoanalyst. Now, they're just the improbability of these things is so amazing, and they keep on going. So that brings me to, uh, I feel grateful for being in the middle of a world mess that might be the mess that we needed in order to understand really what humanity is about. Uh, earlier conflicts and traumas socially uh, were not enough to reveal to us the complexity of our own relationship to the problems we're creating. Now, along with that comes the idea that maybe, just maybe, understanding things is not the highest agenda, that there are other agendas, and we might fail at them, and that that's, in fact, we will, and it's totally okay. Uh, and so I feel very comfortable in a world where uh, I am getting less sleep because I'm working harder than ever. Um, it's quite amazing. I'm 85 and I just do not feel it uh, at all. Uh, so I keep going and um, it's all just amazing. So I'm done. I love that, Doug. Thank you. Let me, um, let's go into silence for a second again, just to absorb the history you shared with us and those observations. Thank you. Um, your story of your conjunctures and all that reminded me of a couple moments of accident in my life where something happened that changed my life. And one of them is my housemate, one of my housemates second year in grad school at Penn uh, said one day, hey, come with me to this seminar. I've got a professor you're probably going to really like. And he, we go into a little room with, a, with like a board table and five grad students and Russell Acuff sitting at the head of the table telling Acuff's fables. And Acuff is one of the founders of systems thinking. I had never heard of him, had no idea what systems thinking was, any of that. And he proceeded to tell stories in 10th grade language that illustrated things that I nobody had ever told me about how the world hangs together. Um, and he had a lifetime of ways of explaining how things fit and work that were really great. Uh, he was not great at human systems. His EQ was pretty damn low. But his SQ, if I can coin systems quotient, was was phenomenal. And that was just one, one little moment uh, that tipped me uh, in that direction. Uh, many years earlier, uh, an early girlfriend uh, pointed me to the works of Alice Miller, who wrote Drama of the Gifted Child. And uh, I, we talked, I read, and I came around quickly to the idea that trauma is pretty much ubiquitous in lots of different ways. And we, we managed to sort of hide and avoid and stamp it down uh, and that um, we sort of need to make our way through it in, in different ways. And I'm sort of even misremembering uh, a lot of the lessons I got from Alice Miller stuff, but there's a lot of those moments for me. Um, Jerry, then, I, yeah, please sorry. go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead sorry. Sorry. No, I just wanted to say that, that, that this just evoked, a, you know, a memory for me of, of, um, my college fraternity advisor at, at, at Syracuse. I don't know why he chose me. I mean, he was a guy who, who lived in the fraternity house. He, he chose me and gave me a hard copy of Carl Rogers' book on becoming a person. No idea why, which then triggered the thought that I remember in high school, having my father write a check in some obscure magazine. I saw an ad for Maxwell Maltz's Psycho-Cybernetics. <laughs> and my father wrote the check and the book came and that was kind of the beginning of a, of a, of a, of a journey. So thanks for evoking those, those, those memories in terms of quote origin stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you for jumping in like with that. I appreciate it. Um, 
And then I, I took some notes in the chat as we were all talking and everybody said a lot of things that I'm equally grateful for. So I think what I want to say is um, I want to build on on a couple of things that were already that are already in this space. Uh, the first one is the thing I noticed when I opened the Zoom room and you all began to show up, which is like when when I first tried another another one of these weird little conjunctions for me was I was at New Science Associates in early in my career as a tech industry trends analyst. I had just broken up with a girlfriend, and one of my colleagues said, "Hey, Jerry, you seem kind of blue." Um, the missus and the kids and I have been attending this Quaker meeting in Wilton. Would you like to join us? And I'd never heard of Quakers, had no idea what it was. And then um, beat them to Quaker meeting on Sunday. I got there before they did. And John Lee greeted me at the door with the warmest handshake I think I've ever felt, handed me the little pamphlet that says, hey, here's what, what silent meeting is all about. And I went in and sat down and then spent more time there than, than Frank and his family did until I left and moved into Manhattan. Um, but had that feeling that I have often here, which is I'd go in, I try to show up a little early to the meeting and just go sit on the far side of the room and just watch people as they came in. And it's quiet. You know, what a Quaker meeting is you just go and sit down and you have an hour's silent meditation with people. That's basically functionally what it looks like. But I was having this, this sense of just resonance with humanity and watching people come in. And usually for the first 15 minutes of meeting, kids were allowed in the room. And so there was this one father and son who came in and every time they'd take the same bench and the son would put his head in his, in his father's lap and just kind of not really fall asleep, but just kind of kind of hang out there. And at the 15 minute mark, all the kids would sort of stand up and, and head out to, to go play and do other sorts of things. And... And then people who became dear friends of mine would show up in the room and I would just have this sense. And then I have this sense when we, when we meet here, it's like, I see you and I see you in your spaces and I know something about you in different ways. And we've spent time together here. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for the whole mix of, of what that is and, and how it feels uh, when it works. Um, so that's big for me. Um, I'm, grateful for the birth lotto. I have a lot of privilege as a white guy born into the US who grew up overseas and got to see other sorts of stuff and has the ability to travel and a uh, few attachments anymore because no kids and all parents are dead and uh, things of that nature. And and I'm just um, appreciative of that and probably and don't do enough to balance out the privilege I have with the work I can do in the world, but I'm grateful for it. Um, I'm grateful for the moment in time, as Grace was saying earlier, the power tools that are available to us, uh, you know, at this moment, um, I and many of us are, I'm holding a little slab of unobtainium here that has a high definition video camera with which I can record and then upload for free or zero marginal cost, except for the energy costs to the earth, uh, videos that I create or that I take or that other people create and we can share them out. And we have near instantaneous global communications, which are crazy. And I'm old enough that I grew up without email, without computer, without, you know, all those kinds of things. And I'm familiar with index cards in, uh, in the card catalog at the library and all of that. And I've seen that span show up. Um, there was a, there was a cool moment when I was a tech analyst where I got on loan. Actually, gosh, I, I have it in the other room. I should, uh, maybe I'll bring it. Um, it's a leather pouch that has, uh, in it, uh, an old HP model 100, which is a little clamshell DOS computer connected to a fat, heavy modem, a uh, radio modem from Artis. And Artis is the network that IBM and Motorola built for FedEx to do the first Cosmo system. FedEx was a great, you know, like, like their edge was, they could tell you where your package was. And that was because of this data network. And so I got to use this data network just for email. That's it. And I remember flying into uh, O'Hare in the winter, taking the shuttle to my hotel, opening up this little thing, plugging in the wire, and then sending an email going, oh my God, this is so cool, right? And now it's like, email? Who does email? And that, like, this is such a given now. And it's so commonplace that I, that I have lived during that span of time thrills me uh, because I have context to go back and know what it was like before. And you can't unsee big changes like that. If you're born into a world where there's, you know, automatic teller machines, the idea of standing in line to go to a teller is like, wait, why would you do that? 
And then nowadays, I don't go to ATMs anymore, period. Everything is is touch transactions and whatever, and will sort of be past it. Internal, you know, internal combustion engines will be a relic of the past, much as horses uh, crapping in our streets is a, is a thing of the past. So all of that. Um, and then... Um, And I think that's it. I think that's that's sort of my my uh, my check in with that. Um, and uh, Stuart is asking, was the Quaker meeting in Philadelphia? Um, I had not discovered the Quakers in Philly when I was there, Stuart. Um, this was Wilton meeting, a Wilton monthly meeting in uh, Wilton, Connecticut. Uh, it was when I first discovered Quakers. Then I went into New York and started working long hours, including weekends. But also, I went to the meetings in New York, and one of the meetings. Um, had divided itself and split into two meetings uh, on the topic of gay marriage. And I was like, wait a minute, y'all are Quakers. You did what? <laughs> and so I, I couldn't I couldn't really find a vibe or the time to to do it. And it kind of broke there, but I still feel very much um, very Quakery. Um, so at this point, we've got some time left in our call and be great to go wherever you'd like to go. Whatever came up, whatever else is on your minds. Things you're looking forward to, things you regret. And we'll do this quicker meeting style. We'll just go into silence and whoever wants to can pipe up. And the silence is really great. The sound drink in the silence. One of the cool things about quicker meeting is if a baby cries in quicker meeting, that's the sound of God. It's okay. They don't need to shush and rush out of the room. And if they're if if they're feeling disturbed and all that, then maybe yes. But but it's like acceptance of the of the sounds of the place. So I'll go quiet again. Sorry. I just would like to share an observation because it's Please. something that I am really grateful for. And I've been in a lot of conversational communities and a lot of Zooms, and I am just really grateful. <laughs> for how I've noticed people have really learned to listen to each other and how important that is. And I don't know if we really recognize that, you know, it's not just like people out there that have problems that need to be heard. We all do. And I think that we've become really good at listening. And I, I definitely see a change in the way different calls look. So I just wanted to share that and express that. And thank you all. Thanks, Stacey. I just hope that extends you know, my, my, for, for this coming year um, into a broader context so we don't have another year of chaos and turmoil you know, in, in, in our national decision-making uh, process. And you know, it, it's queuing up to be another mess, you know, the way it's going right now. And I sure hope there's a point of reflection you know, in, in people who make those decisions and drive those, uh, uh, those, those systems forward to understand how precarious uh, our situation really is and, and how uh, uh, the moment is how, how the urgency, you know, of the moment for us to come together and uh, and face up to to this reality. I think what what really has struck me over the last you know, few weeks is how disconnected we are from the natural world. Now, uh, the and and I mean, I was most certainly completely unaware you know, of, of how does the biosphere work and how does nature work and how are we linked up and so on. And it's going to really kill us. I mean, it's just, uh, um, so you have you know, very, very smart people, very well-educated people arrive at conclusions absent of an understanding of, of the externalities, these conclusions would drive to you know, this this the uh, I think Heidegger called it Erdverbundenheit, you know, the link to the earth or or you know have the crown being grounded in nature. Um so so I would uh, um if we could just slow down for a moment and think 
now and and get away from from this chaos and and uh mayhem that we that we're in the middle of i think that would be my hope for 2023 thank you class we're we're shockingly separated from each other from nature uh from meaning all those kinds of things and one of my narratives uh 30 years ago I realized I didn't like the word consumer one of the conclusions I got to about consumerism consumer society and the consumer frame is that it does that to us it separates us from each other so that we can be rugged individuals and brand ourselves with you know I do Nike you do Adidas and that's how I you know declare my identity and all that kind of stuff and it separates us from nature because we don't need to you know treat nature well we got people making stuff for us and there's abundant stuff in the world and then the second thing I wanted to add was what you just voiced is one of the reasons I am here in these OGM conversations. I, I put in the chat the civilizational implications of OGM. Uh, to me, to me personally, the reason I really give a damn about this this work we do together is that if we can solve uh, how to have conversations about these serious issues with people about some of the crises facing humanity, we might actually find our way to working together to solve them instead of being in this Mexican standoff, which we find ourselves in world worldwide. Like there's so many elections that are hair's breadth elections. Uh, half the world seems to be fighting the other half instead of everybody turning toward the things that we could solve together. And if we can sort out that mess, and part of that is soft and emotional and about trust and psychological safety and vulnerability and all those good things and then half of that is about all right so what's the evidence say and what should we do and how do we do it so for me all of that fits in here um rick please yeah uh, one thing that uh, i just wanted to contrast I, I i've been trained as a family therapist and i just want to compare the stories between john kelly and grace and that is that how families can heal, but they can also tear themselves apart. And just to dovetail on what Stacy and Klaus were saying, well, Stacy, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think there is a movement in that direction. But to echo Klaus's um, reality perspective is that um, there are there are many mitigating factors, uh, and we're we're in in a place where. You know, I think we have to think what has to die for us to heal, or is it going to tear us apart? Um, and I had a very interesting conversation with an Australian colleague of mine last week who I went to his uh, complexity conference, and it was a small international conference. And he and I have great disagreements. We, I really love disagreeing with him about our differences. And one of the words that he um, he he had a very negative reaction to was virtues hmm. and from from an australian perspective at least his australian perspective because he's german australian um is that he had a very negative connotation to the word and he was saying it was a cultural american thing and i said to him no nah, it's older than that it goes back to you know you know aristotle so socrates etc and, and then I was on a, another call with another German. I raised this issue up um, and she, she gave the, word, the German word for virtues. And she said, you know, in Germany, virtues has a bit of a negative connotation to it. It's sort of two good issues. And so when we have words, when our language can get perverted, and this is one of the things that negative deviants do so well, is they turn something negative into a positive and vice versa. And if we can't out wordsmith the negative deviance and the propagandists, which which is happening, um, we're not going to we're not going to we're not going to win the verbal war. So I think the challenge is, is how can we? I mean, today, from my point of view, has been a very nice demonstration of what needs to be amplified, and how can you create upward virtual spirals that can reverse the downward spirals into the amoral abyss. And that's the epic battle of civilizations. So, um, Rick, thank you for that. And I love the last bit you put there because uh, some of you have been here when Paul Crafell has come into the room and he did a video years ago about upward spirals, which Arthur Brock sent me. And I watched and it was one of those little moments that changed my life a bunch. 
Um, and what was interesting was that the reason Paul Kerfell showed up in these rooms was that a couple of years ago, somewhere mid pandemic, he said, gosh, I decided I wanted to meet more people and see what's up. So I Googled my own name and you came up. Um, because I'm a fan of his and I had mentioned Upward Spiral and, and all that kind of stuff. And a piece of what I'm trying to figure out is how can we behave in a way that creates an upward spiral that causes uplift? Uh, uplift is sort of a term David Brin sort of popularized more from the science fiction realm. It's less, less interesting than to me than Upward Spiral. Uh, but I then coined the term up keto because my sport is Aikido. And up keto is a hypothetical practice that, uh, or that you might go to a dojo to learn uh, where everything you touch is improved by your presence. Um, so what, what, what is that like? And if you think about that in, in the sense of when you're sending an email, when you're greeting a person who's come to drop something off, when, you know, whatever else it might be. So, uh, Judy. And you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I was channeling the same thing, Jerry, that, that one of the things that this group as individuals does each time is that the individual expression of hope and charity and many other virtues is abundant in this call. And I suspect that most of us in the other settings where we go attempt to insert positive energy into whatever situation we're facing. And that sort of dendritic expanse might be the antidote to what's going on. If, if we kind of moved it from the unconscious to the at least partially conscious and thought about it because we have the opportunity to infect in a positive way a lot of people through all of the people that we associate with. My apologies, Judy. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Ken? I realized one of the things I didn't list on my gratitude list, which is incredibly important to me, is music and art. Um, I don't have a TV. I've been, I got rid of my TV in 1990 and thought I'd buy another one when I got to California and realized, you know, it's kind of nice not having a TV. And I haven't had one now for over 30 years but uh unfortunately someone gave me a subscription on netflix so i do actually watch netflix on my computer and some tv shows but i listen to a lot of music and um one of the uh amazing finds that i, I had in this past year is a french fellow by the name of jacques Lossier who plays bach uh and i'm gonna put the link to his to youtube for him this guy is an incredible jazz pianist who brings a jazzy edge. The Plays Bach Trio, if you want to have just a delightful experience today of listening to some really amazing music, click on that link and have yourself a good time. Wednesday is certainly a unique name. I'm guessing it was the day of the week you were born. I was born on Friday the 13th. Stuart, <laughs> is that you playing the link? <laughs> That's very funny. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Uh, if anybody, if everybody would like to put uh, one or more of your favorite musicians' names in the chat right this minute, please to do so. Uh, uh, Ken, one of the, uh, I don't know Lucier. He looks great. I'm going to go check him out. My equivalent for that in nearby genres of music is Claude Bowling, uh, who has a whole suite, a uh, whole set of albums called uh, Suite for Flute and Jazz Piano. Uh, suite for uh, guitar and jazz piano, et cetera, et cetera. Toot Suite is another one. And apparently when the first one of these was brought into a, a record company for maybe production, they started playing it in one of the offices and everybody from all the offices showed up and stood in the door and was like, what is this? Uh, it's just beautiful music. So if anybody else wants to put, oh my God, two of you just put Jackson Brown in simultaneously. That's crazy synchronicity. That was really interesting. Jean-Michel Jarry. So I just completed work on a 4,000 song playlist. Uh, it's taken me several months, but it goes through many genres and many moods. You yeah, also I did a list of books and a list of documentaries and movies. Yeah, I've been cataloging 
different stuff in my life. But uh, my my music library just on my computer has got like um, 120 days worth of, you know, it's, it's half my hard drive is music. <laughs> uh, Ken, is any of this available? And no, it's all on my hard drive. It's I don't. It's not on Spotify or anything like that. But um, uh, now, what can I say? Limited sharing. Okay. <laughs> um, but Claude Bowling is fantastic. He's uh, I have several of his albums, and um, yeah, just I I got stuff from all over the world, all different periods of genres and periods of time, and and you know I've also become a huge uh, Chet Atkins fan. I've really come to appreciate Chet Atkins, where you know I used to be like, oh, I don't do country music, and it's like, no, this is not country. This is just great guitar playing. I have a YouTube um, playlist called When I Die. Um, and in my death documents, it basically says, Hey, you know, send this out, um, with whatever notice you do. And it's a collection of very meaningful music to me and, uh, in different ways. And, um, I can share a link to it here. Other thoughts? We have a few minutes left in our, in our time together. Just a quick reaction uh, to Ken, and that is the whole notion of music therapy and how it's used in uh, neurological disorders, including stroke. So it's, uh, I, I, I'm not up on it, but I'm aware of it. Let's put it that way. So feeding the soul with music, I think, is uh, has, uh, we need to understand the benefits better. Yeah, that, that actually reminds me of, um... Of hydrotherapy, aside from music therapy, hydrotherapy, being in water a lot. And, and just interesting, I've been swimming for the last 30 years and, and spent a bunch of time in the hot tub. And I was reading a biography a couple of years ago of the, the insane poet Robert Lowell, who was, you know, diagnosed <laughs> manic depressive. And one of the things in the in the in the psych notes was that they treated him with hydrotherapy, which just made me kind of chuckle. <laughs> well, Stuart, I just have to respond to this because in our neighborhood, I hadn't paid any attention to it before. And for some reason I noticed it. There's a, a flotation spa, which is uh you go into a hypertonic solution. It's sort of big clam. You go inside, you float, mm -hmm. you're floating above the water. And it's like going into a meditative state. It goes completely dark. You can have music. I prefer black, no nothing. Um, and I, I go into this twilight zone between consciousness and consciousness. And it feels like I've only been in there for about 15, 20 minutes. And I'm just amazed it's been an hour. So it's uh, something that I'm treating myself on a weekly basis at the moment. So... It's an interesting experience. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, Doug. Yeah, just a little contribution on group process. I run a group that meets in Zoom, and we start the meeting, usually about 15 people, going around the room, and each person saying what's been on their mind they think is most worthy of a serious conversation. The innovation is that... Uh, because it's in Zoom, you can't quite tell where the, where the circle is. So I had it that the first person who talks picks the next person to speak. And the drama of who they're going to pick really heightens the energy in the group. And it's worked amazingly well. And the people that people pick to be the next speaker is usually strategically right on as to where the group needs to go. So it's worked extraordinarily well. Uh, thanks, Doug. When I do introduction rounds at retreats, I use that. Um, and I have, and the funny thing is, when somebody is fully present introducing themselves, they sort of forget that step. And so very, very, very often you have to remind people, oh, and who's next? Um, but then the who's next part really works well. Um, and then one time at a meeting, I brought a kush ball in figuring there'd be like a token pass and this is something you could kind of toss. And I removed the kush ball from the room where somebody like hurled it across the room, knocked over a glass of water. And uh, I was like, where did that energy come from? Um, so anyway, but thank you. 
uh, Leon Redbone. I put a link in uh, to, I have a thought in my brain for my favorite music from different genres, favorite Latin musicians, because I adore Latin American music. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of, there's, there's a couple of movements from Latin America that are probably my favorite genres. Uh, one of them is called Nueva Trova, or the new wave from Argentina, Peru, <clears throat> basically the dictatorships in South America. Uh, a lot of people emigrated, just left, went to France. Some people stayed in, in the countries. And the music is sort of protest music in different ways. And then in Brazil, it's called Musica Popular Brasileira, MPB, or Tropicalismo, is a related category. And that's similar, similar era, all that music. Uh, and uh, there's a, a bunch of just really fan It's beautiful and meaningful music at the same time. Yeah, I, I wanted to kind of, Hank, thank you for that post in chat about um, about Jackson Brown. Um, it, it, he's an amazing combination of extraordinary pop music and these amazing, amazing lyrics that chronicle where we are and the power of social commentary. I saw him last year at, at the Oxbow stage in Napa, and it was like being at a revival meeting. He has dropped his pretty boy image, let himself go gray, uh, and his hair is kind of long and, and, and stringy a bit. But it was like being in a church or a synagogue. It was just absolutely extraordinary to be outside at night with him singing these amazing lyrics. And it was almost like he was preaching, not just singing, like, like wake up, uh, wake up, wake up, wake up. And, and the music that went along with it, it was just a, an extraordinary experience. Yeah. You know, if I may bring Please. to your attention one one uh, clip here that I posted, it's coming alive. Um, there's a, I posted a short version and then the full documentary. And there's a guy who who uh, went into a senior home and uh, started uh, putting music uh, to, onto people that that was from their era. Meaning, if you are talking to an eighty year old person, you play music that was in their teens right 15 to 20 year yeah. old and there is just it's just stunning you know when you when you watch this one little clip there the short clip of this uh, a black gentleman who was just like totally gone uh, and by the when they put the music on him he he literally came back alive it, it was it, it's just absolutely stunning to watch and then consequently my wife you know put together a music tape for her mother you know, so she cuts uh, music to uh, uh, and 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 her mom is playing this uh, twenty four seven. I mean, every time you come, she has this uh, MP three player going, and uh, it's enough. I mean, there's like you now so many hours on it that it it doesn't become very repetitive. But the power of music is basically uh, echoing in our brains at a level. Uh, that that is so deep, you know. It's so it, it's a it's a subconscious emotional level. So if you haven't seen that, that that's really that's really a, a very interesting uh, observation there. That's really cool, hey. Klaus. Uh, it's also really briefly um, playlists of whatever kind, Spotify, YouTube, whatnot, are really <laughs> handy for family relationships like this. Because my mom wasn't very good at finding her way around apps on her iPad, with the iPad I got her, she couldn't really figure that out. But I could kind of leave a playlist open that she could just sort of hit play and stop. Uh, and then I could feed the playlist from my end, it was just a playlist. Um, and that worked really well. Same thing with a photo album in Google Photos, I basically created an album called, you know, for mom, or Ava's album or whatever. And, um, and that worked really well, because I had I was busy scanning boxes of family photos, and I could drop them in there, and she could just have them on on slideshow. And it, it, you know, it turned into a little slide frame that could that could sit someplace plugged in and work fine. And then I put a link in the chat about the singing revolution. Um, in Estonia, under the Soviet Union, uh, basically singing of uh, patriotic songs and, and sort of folk songs was illegalized. And there's a story of how Estonia had a gentle revolution to break away from the Soviet Union by people starting to sing these songs in public spaces. And then there's a famous moment at a folk festival because folk singing and singing is just a big thing in Estonia where somebody sings one of these songs and some flags come out of the crowd uh, and, and a motorcycle goes by down the street with, a, with a, the, the guy behind the motorcycle ride, rider is holding an, Est uh, an Estonian flag and everybody suddenly realizes we're done, we're out of here. Um, sorry, and Stuart, you were jumping in. 
Yeah, no, what I was just going to say is uh, in the late 90s, every year I used to teach a workshop at Esalen and I created a, a cassette tape and I used to use just tons of music uh, in the teaching. It's very powerful, very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I subscribe to Rufus. No, no, no. Uh, Stephen Berlin Johnson has a Substack newsletter. And yesterday he talked about cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> and he, he talked about how his lifespan, uh, in his lifespan, the, the short life of cassette tapes was really important because mixtapes and everything else. And a little subplot in his post was about India. And he says in India, there was like one record company that had kind of a monopoly on publishing LPs, and they worked with only a couple Indian artists. So the, the, the repertory of music available was incredibly limited. And then suddenly cassettes hit the market and everything exploded. And within, within a couple of years, all the music was being you know shot done in, 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 uh, on, on cassettes. There were markets for it. Everything else went crazy. And Stuart, you sound like you know a lot about this. Well, no, what I was just going to say is one of the reasons I hold on to my 2000 VW yellow bug with a sunflower is because it has a cassette tape in it. Oh, really? <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Here's the here's the link to Stuart's. Uh, I thought those thing. came with eight track tapes. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so who, who here ever had an eight track tape? I did not. Uh, I missed the eight track thing. I was like on cassettes and then over to yeah. CD, CD audio. My wife we had, had, a, one we had a sky blue VW bug with an eight track tape in it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> this is a new, yeah. At Columbia. This, is a, this is one of the new Beatles, Grace. It's one of the one of the one of the the new models. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sweet, mm -hmm. uh, Rick. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on what Klaus was talking about generational differences. Uh, at the closing of this other conference I went to, they had a dance party, and the music was not my genre. Uh, and so I went up to the DJ and I said, you know, could you could you say play We Are Family? And the old timers in the group um, knew this from other conferences and the old timers came together and we, we created this huge circle of people all dancing arms and arm. And then it led to another event. But the, the thing was, I just felt I couldn't dance to some of this. It's not my generational music, you know, and it, it makes a huge difference. So it, it had a, you know, it, it echoes what you were saying, Jerry, about how music can pull people together. So um, I couldn't help but share that because it was, uh, it, it takes me back to old conferences where we used that song. Well, My observation is having gone to lots of weddings and bar mitzvahs and other events is that if you play Motown, everybody gets up. Doesn't matter whether they're young or old, everybody's on the floor for Motown. As soon as you switch to other stuff, people drift in and out, but everybody moves to Motown. <laughs> We know these songs, they're deeply embedded. Um, thank you very much. This has been really, really lovely. Um, I th there's a couple more holidays where we have Thursdays and I'm, I will do the same thing, well, you know, cause it'll be early in the day. Uh, I really appreciate you all being here. Yeah, I'm grateful for your presence. Likewise. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank Good you. to wonderful, see you. Wonderful conversation. Great Thanks. rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the music. Go ahead and eat too much. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I have license to do so now. <laughs>